Thank you, Valerie. And I just want to add a little bit to your economic uh, argument. Um, the National Science Foundation lists uh, uh, populations that have been minoritized in computing as uh, including women, African Americans, uh, Latinx, Native American, Pacific Islanders, and Alaska Natives, and uh, also people with disabilities. And if you bring all of those groups together, that's more than 70% of the population. And so if those people are working on technology, if those groups are working on technology, then we have a huge talent pool to draw from. So that's definitely uh, the economic argument in addition to the equity argument of making these exciting and, and uh, high paying careers available to everyone. Thank you, Mary, and thank you for providing that also the additional clarification from the perspective of NSF. And now I want to turn to Richard Latner, who is Professor Emeritus in the Paul G. Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Washington. Richard is the PI for the NSF-funded Access Computing Alliance which aims to increase the participation of people with disabilities in computing fields. So Richard, love to hear your perspective about the importance of diverse experience and backgrounds in HPC. Sure, thank you, Valerie. Um, I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, yeah, so my specialty in broadening participation is uh, disability. I've been doing this for, oh gosh, who knows how long, maybe 30 or 40 years. And one of the things uh, I feel strongly about is that people with disabilities have really helped create innovation in the world. If you think about some innovations like um, personal video, so you know, like the video phone and things like that, uh, deaf people were using that long before the rest of us. Uh, there was a small company called Sorensen in Utah that uh, created this ability so that deaf people could talk to each other in sign language from their homes. I'm sure most of you have never heard of that, but that innovation needed, you know, much better data compression or video compression. It needed, it didn't really need to worry so much about audio because they weren't using audio. But a lot of the innovations that came from video compression came from the fact that deaf people wanted to talk to each other in sign language remotely. And there's lots of other examples as well. So when you think of innovation, and this group, SC21, that's all about innovation, you want to include people with disabilities because they do things a little bit differently. They think a little bit differently, and that's so important. Yes. Thank you, Richard. And, and those are really good examples because while you have technology that may start off for people with disabilities, it actually becomes applicable to the larger population as well. So excellent point. And our third participant today in the round table is Mary Ann Liu, who is a leader in the design and implementation of innovative workforce development programs. She is the founder and president of Sustainable Horizons Institute, a nonprofit organization dedicated to cultivating a diverse STEM workforce. And Marianne, look forward to your response about the importance of diversity. Thank you, Valerie, for the kind introduction and for um, inviting me to participate in this panel. I'm very excited about uh, the conversation that we're going to have. Um, so in terms of the importance of diversity, um, really, uh, I, I want to kind of follow up on the comments you made about the um, uh, the reasons why uh, diversity is important and, and along with what Mary said as well as Richard. So we know that science and HPC in particular is more and more becoming a team sport. Um, and there are bigger and bigger teams that, are, that we're, we're finding that are needed to solve the problems that we're able to because HPC gives us a lot of power and so we're tackling bigger problems. So by bringing together um, diverse perspectives and diverse people from different backgrounds, um, it will lead to uh, advanced innovations and profitability, as you mentioned. 
And then another really important aspect is that um, our, you know, our workforce is, uh, the demographics are changing. And if we continue to uh, leave out groups uh, that are currently underrepresented in the workforce for the HPC, we're gonna have some real challenges in meeting the growing demands for a skilled workforce. Okay, thank you. Excellent opening remarks. So thank you, Mary Ann, Mary, and also Richard. So let's go to our next question. And that has to do with barriers. So that is, if you can comment what you find to be a major barrier in terms of increasing diversity in HPC. So to start this question, um, let's start with Mary Ann and then see if others want to chime in. Okay, thank you, Valerie. So um, the very barriers that we see um, the kind of the biggest barriers are, well, initially a lot of um, times people look towards the pipeline as the barrier. We just need to get more people into the pipeline and exposed. Um, but on our experience, there really are plenty of people that from underrepresented groups who want to develop careers in HPC. They do need some scaffolding and exposure to opportunities, but the supply is there. So while our work focuses on helping people from underrepresented groups to develop careers, much of our work is also really focused on creating environments that are open to diversity, equity, and inclusion, where ultimately our goal is to catalyze the normalization of inclusion. That is, create environments where just including everyone is the norm. Um, so many of the organizations that we work with, um, they've developed very successful models for recruiting and, and developing and retaining their, their workforce. Um, however, those models have tended to rely on their existing networks, and that has um, led to a very homogeneous workforce. So we think some of the biggest barriers is the difficulty in helping organizations to change those models so they can be more inclusive, they can uh, reach more diverse uh, groups of people to recruit and retain them. Um, and um, yeah, so it's changing those models. Really what we need is a real change of paradigm. And it really uh, relies on leaders to try to lead that change and everyone in the workforce um, uh, working towards figuring out how to change those models. Thank you for the environment and changing those models. And let me just open it up and see if Richard or Mary also have comments here. I, I'd like to talk to, speak to this question. So, um, you know, wearing my hat as a director of the School of Computing at, at a university, um, the kinds of barriers that we see uh, are uh, people from, uh, from uh, these minoritized populations not even trying computing in the first place, not taking the first class and not, uh, and not sticking with it even after they've taken the first class. And so um, we did, at the University of Utah, we did a careful examination of our uh, introductory programming sequences in order to, and I'm speaking from, I know that SE is broader than computer science, I'm speaking from the computer science perspective, but uh, the, we, we redesigned our introductory programming sequence to make it more welcoming, to have uh, an accelerated course for people who have some background in computing coming into college and having uh, a two semester sequence for everyone else. And so by pulling out the students with background and putting them in a, a, a accelerated class, they're not in the same class with everyone else and maybe making the other students feel intimidated. Um, we do see even coming into college that uh, another barrier is just not having the math preparation that you need to be successful uh, right away in computing. So being able to uh, bring everyone up in terms of their math skills if they're, uh, maybe they didn't go to the best high school and they need a little bit of extra work. And so, so that's another uh, barrier that we try to eliminate. And then um, we're very fortunate at the University of Utah, we have a Center for High Performance Computing and they have run a boot camp 
during the summer where students actually build a cluster kind of semi-student cluster competition uh, in, a, in a very short period of time. So we have these activities around, uh, you know, we have boot camp, we've had student cluster competition teams that, you know, you, you need some, we have a lot of students involved in undergrad research, so you need some sort of simulation that gets them involved in, the, in working in the area. And so, you know, that's kind of, uh, create, addressing the, the college level uh, barriers. And then we just generally need to create a culture that is, uh, that doesn't turn people off from computing. And uh, we need to do that at our conference too. So I'm gonna put in a plug for SIG HPC Cares. Uh, that's something we're doing here at uh, SE for the first time where uh, we have a committee that you, uh, uh, people walking around wearing this button, uh, sitting in the inclusivity office that can help you. If you have a bad experience at the conference, um, uh, you are, somebody is, is violating ACM policies. And so just knowing that that kind of uh, organization exists is then uh, making the, uh, the conference more inclusive as well. So, so generally thinking about inclusion is important across all the different uh, parts of the, the pipeline. Thanks, Mary. And, and I just wanted to see if, if Richard wanted to add or. Yeah, a little bit. Um, I think um, one barrier that I've noticed for a long, long time is that people don't think about disability. They don't think about accessibility as part of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I wanted to point out um, an executive order that President Biden put out on June 25th, 2021 called Executive Order on Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility in the Federal Workforce. And perhaps some of you have seen this, people that work at national labs perhaps have seen this executive order. And it's really you know, a call to action for everybody to do what both Mary Ann and, and uh, Mary were telling you to do, but also including people dis with disabilities. That's why there's an A at the end. So think about maybe adding that in. If you have a DEI, program, think about adding in DEIA for accessibility so that that group, which is often left out, it, it was mentioned last in the list that Mary mentioned so earlier. So it's, it's often overlooked. And I think that's a, a main barrier. And I already said earlier that, you know, people with disabilities can really benefit HPC and, and science generally. And we all know about Stephen Hawking. We know about uh, other people, Albert Einstein, they, you know, these huge names in physics, uh, they all had disabilities. And probably some of your colleagues have a disability, a hidden disability that you don't know about. Um, so think about adding accessibility to your DEI work. Thank you, Richard. And, and I also want to add and note, you know, as was mentioned, the importance of um, diversity also in terms of bringing individual backgrounds to bear. And I think that gets at also what was raised earlier, and that was how we frame and present computing and high performance computing. And for example, the problems that we present. So, you know, and, you know, I'll give an example, for example, in a course on uh, computing, that is oftentimes faculty will give projects but one idea is to have students actually, you know, present ideas for projects that may help their community. And so that's a way to bring forth your cultural aspects. And that could be in terms of looking at gender, ethnicity, culture, accessibility, and all of those aspects to say, here's a problem that's important to my community. And you know, how can we use HPC in terms of addressing those problems? And it may be, for example, looking at sensor networks in, in terms of a community, um, looking at things having to do with flooding, looking at things having to do with air quality. There are so many opportunities. So this is a really rich in terms of what can be done with HPC. So, and I think too, it gets to the point about also the small numbers 
because you want to have a critical mass. And sometimes that critical mass is there virtually instead of in person. You may <laughs> reaching out beyond a particular site. So I want to turn now to, and I think you've mentioned some of these things, but I want to be explicit about it. And that is looking at some best practices um, in the space of looking at increasing diversity in HPC. And so with that, um, if we want to start off, and, um, and that is looking at um, Mary in terms of best practices. I know you mentioned a, num a number of what's being done at um, Utah and also what's being done in academia, but want to give an opportunity to have that focus. So if you want to start us off, Mary. Uh, I, Our I, best practices. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I, I at least thought through the, the things that we're doing. I mean, another thing that we have done that kind of uh, matches what you were talking about, Valerie, we, uh, uh, we have this new center. It's funded by uh, Pivotal Ventures through uh, Northeastern Center for Inclusive Computing. And one of the things it's allowed us to do is, is hire a bunch of student ambassadors. And we're just getting started with this, so I can't tell you enough about what they're doing. But you know, just to bring in some students who are already attracted to working in a center, something that's called Center for Inclusive Computing, um, we're just requiring that they be majors, they write an essay, provide a, a resume. And we've attracted just really interesting students who maybe want, you know, maybe they didn't always feel included and they want to help other people feel included. And so um, I think they're going to help us a lot because they're going to give us the student perspective. They're going to look at, uh, they're going to do tours and they're going to reach out to students. And so just being able to get a group like that together, and this is, you know, goes beyond the women, we have a women in computing group, you know, it goes beyond these sort of, uh, uh, individual group kind of uh, clubs to, uh, to a, a, a set of students that are going to reach a lot of people. And um, we're still figuring out what to do, all the things that they can do to help us. But we think that that will be really uh, important uh, going forward. Sounds great. And it's great to get the students engaged. Um, that, that too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know. And, and just want to open it up to Marianne and also Richard in terms yeah. of best practices. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just uh, mention. Go ahead, oh, Marianne. Okay. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Richard. Okay. I'll, 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 <laughs> Richard? Do a quick one. I'll, I'll do a quick one. You know, all of us that are, you know, science and technology, you know, we do videos, we have conferences and stuff like that. And I don't know if this conference has captions, does it? I didn't see any on my screen. Um, I don't know if people in the live audience have captions, but that's a basic thing that everybody should have with a video. And um, I think, you know, I would call that a best practice. And I'm, I'm really proud, for example, of what Valerie has done with CMDIT, her organization, and all their videos have captions. Um, and so just one little thing you can do, and when you have the captions, on your videos or you have the captions in your conference, then that sends a message to everyone that you are welcoming. That, that rings with people who are African-American, Hispanic, Native American, uh, Polynesian, and so on, that, hmm, there's, there's captions there. That, that means they're thinking about accessibility, they're thinking about other people. So little small things like that make a big difference. Now, maybe you don't have to do it by law, uh, if you had a TV program, you would I have to do it by law. But, you know, that, that sends a message that you're welcoming. Marianne, go ahead. And, and if you, I can actually inject one thing, and that is with the SC conference, I know with the hub platform, you can um, select video with captioning. So mm -hmm. it is available. It is available. Is Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, Marianne, I just wanted to inject that. Oh, no, I'm glad you did. That's great. Um, yeah, so I'd love to talk a little bit about best practices, and I'm going to pick up on the thread that you put out there about critical mass. 
And um, so as we know, um, in especially in HPC, the numbers are pretty low for many of the underrepresented groups in terms of current representation. And so um, developing critical mass is really important. And we have um, created some programs to try to address this in such a way that it balances critical mass with integration into the larger uh, you know, groups as well. And, you know, very often when you're um, kind of one of the only ones that looks like you or, or has a particular dimension that you're, that you, uh, you know, you uh, represent, um, you know, it feels a little lonely and um, it almost is, creates a situation where it's like the canary in the mine where you're not sure if it's safe for you to go into an environment and you end up being a little bit of a guinea pig. So um, we try to create programs where we um, create critical, critical mass within the broader context um, of the groups. And, um, and then in, by doing that, we also create um, opportunities for everyone to learn from each other about how to create more inclusive environments. Uh, one of the programs we, we run is called Sustainable Research Pathways, and that's where we bring in faculty and students or students on their, on their own into um, some of the uh, Department of Energy National Laboratories uh, to do uh, to collaborate on research and then go to a conference and present their research. And again, it's uh, uh, balancing integration with um, critical mass in that way. And it gives everyone a chance to learn from each other and to uh, open up eyes. Um, we've had a lot of the uh, researchers that have worked with us th through this program tell us mm -hmm. they would have never imagined that they could find such great talent in talent in places where they would have never looked. And those could be at you know, HBCUs or HSIs or small liberal arts colleges or community colleges, you know, you, you can find really great people if you open your eyes to the possibilities and get exposure to that. So um, that's what we, we have found as a really great best practice to try to balance that critical mass, create critical mass, but also balance it with, um, within the broader community. Right. And it's really great with SRP that you also involve faculty, because then year after year, the faculty can talk about the program to students. And so it gives that also longevity with engagement with the faculty. And, and I just want to take this opportunity to add one, um, an additional best practice, and that is disaggregating data. Um, and that is we get into the mode of a lot of data collection, but we also need to look at disaggregating data. And that is, so I'll just speak from personal experience because I see this a great deal. And that is, I'll see data that may be with ethnicity, it may be with race, it may gender, it may be disability. But, you know, for example, I may ask the question, how many African-American women are in a, at a particular site or involved in a particular committee? Knowing women, knowing African-American doesn't give me the number. And so having the data that represents intersectionality and disaggregated can go a long way as well. So I just wanted to um, add that as well of disaggregating data. So I do want to have some time for questions and I do see some questions. So I'll go to some of the questions. And that is one question that came up was, you know, right now, and especially we're participating remotely. So <laughs> how do you think the increase in remote work can help the diversity in hiring? And so I want to raise that question and see if you anyone wants to start off ask, answering that particular question in terms of the remote work. Um, I'll, I'll jump in, but I'm sure Richard probably has more to say. So I'll just quickly say something. And that is uh, in our experience, um, just through the pandemic and now everyone's living remotely, that um, we've seen um, a lot of opportunities to bring in more people from underrepresented groups into, um, into programs, into uh, workforces and whatnot, because we are able to reach out to more people and people can join in. So 
I'm going to defer now to Richard. <laughs> Thank you, Marianne. Yeah, um, remote work is, I think it's here forever. In fact, it was around before. I know uh, several companies that were completely remote work and and these were accessibility related companies because the people that are sort of specialists in accessibility live all over the place. And, uh, and, and maybe in India, for example. Now, it's really hard to have a meeting from somebody in the United States and somebody in India because of the time zones and stuff like that. But there are some downsides to remote work. Um, I, I was just asked to go to a uh, a meeting, they put up a when to meet form and the times available were for me in my time zone, 5 a.m. was the first one. I, why did they even do that in the first place? <laughs> so it, there are some problems, but there are people that with disabilities that have really taken advantage of it. People who have autism, for example, you know, they, they like to maybe often like to work alone. They still want to have their meetings and stuff like that. But the you know, being around a bunch of people or having a lot of distractions can actually slow down their work as opposed to speed it up. And so it worked well. There are people who it's hard to get to work. Uh, people who are blind, for example, it's hard to get to work or blind, deaf blind, or just, you know, they're, they're in a wheelchair or something like that, things like that. So having remote work really benefits people like that, that, that or mobility is an issue and, and just getting to work is an issue. Now, maybe, you know, somebody like that would come into work once a week uh, or something like that, but they don't have to come in every day. So right. it's here to stay. And I think it is quite beneficial uh, generally for people with disabilities. But of course, there are some downsides I mentioned earlier. Okay. And we also have, um, before I go to the next question, just wanted to see if there were any other comments to um, the question about remote work. Okay. Then there is a question in terms of, as we talked about best practices. And so the question has to do with which of the best practices that we've discussed would be easiest for implementation, either in terms of community acceptance or in terms of level of effort. Hmm. I would just comment that, you know, getting uh, student ambassadors, uh, you know, I'm talking about the academic perspective, but I'm sure that this, there's a version of this that translates into other organizations. Uh, having organizations that are, whose mission is to do inclusion um, without, without like overburdening uh, people who are from these minoritized groups, just having some sort of organization where people can give back, where you can really get their opinions. I think that's easy for anybody to implement and just needs to be careful that, you just need to be careful that you're not saying, oh, you know, the diversity committee is, is every new woman that comes in, you know, to our organization or whatever, you know, that, that you make sure that there's some balance and, and, and that that is a shared burden. So I think that's easy. Um, honestly, I've been working on uh, making change at my university for over a decade. And there are things you can do around the edges, but you really have to do the hard things. Um, and you know, we revamped our curriculum, and that's a hard thing, but it was really a critical. And so, um, you know, I think the easy things are, are have value and, and help uh, help build community. But I think the hard things are the ones that you have to do to make real change. Okay. Other comments? Yeah, can I just quickly quickly add to that? I think uh, one thing that many people think is hard is making your websites uh, uh, like accessible to screen reader users. And this isn't, it isn't really that hard, but you have to learn how to do it. So there is that kind of learning curve that your company or your uh, department or whatever organization you're in has to invest something in the beginning to learn how to do things accessibly, uh, especially accessible web pages. Uh, but once you, mastered that, then it's pretty easy from then on, because you're going to do things born accessibly rather than retrofitting afterwards. And this also has to do with applications, software applications, and so on. Better to think about accessibility early 
then to, so, so to try to add it on later. Oh, let's let's do that later. So I don't know how many uh, HPC companies are concerned with accessibility, but many more should be, I'm sure. Excellent point. Okay. Any other comments to, I think also disaggregation of data, as you have data, you know, um, if the metadata is there to disaggregate, you know, I would encourage the disaggregation. Um, and because it helps to look at trends and to see what's going on possibly with recruiting, with retention, with rate of progression, and all of those different aspects. And that can relate to academia as well as in terms of the labs and industry, the disaggregation of data. And so... Um, can I mention oh, one ahead. more real quickly? So companies, uh, Microsoft, Google, Salesforce, now these are not HPC companies. I guess Microsoft is an HPC company. <laughs> and probably Google is too. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, they have inclusive hiring programs. And some of them are really models for, you know, how should you hire somebody? Should you put them through the same rigorous, you know, get at the whiteboard, do, answer these questions and stuff like that? That doesn't work for everybody. And so having a more, and, and this does take, it's something that, again, takes some time to build up, to start up. But once you have it, then it does make things a lot easier. And you will have, hire more people who uh, are on the autism spectrum, who are really good employees, though. So think about inclusive hiring and also inclusive uh, promotion and advancement in your, in your companies. So I'll add one quick note, uh, Valerie, if that's all right. Um, oh, definitely. Uh, <laughs> so um, I think um, one thing that's easy to do is um, to, uh, to harness the excitement that's there now. So one of the things that we're really um, uh, excited about is how much um, interest there is in uh, promoting inclusion and you know, organizations that we work with, you know, people are stepping up and saying, "Hey, I want to do something. What can I do?" And so we're trying to, you know, you know, work with people that harness this power because it's out there. There's a lot of interest. A lot of people want to do something to create more inclusive environments. So start, you know, getting them to work. Let them let them do things. Some people might uh, need to learn a little bit about what they can do. They don't know what they can do, but um, there's a whole lot of, um, of uh, resource out there, I think, to, to start tackling some of these problems. Definitely. And I think here with the this roundtable is an excellent group in terms of reaching out to about resources, about programs is really great. So I know I'm, I'm looking at the time. So we have about two minutes left and I wanna use this time to give everyone about 30 seconds to <laughs> provide some concluding remarks about the importance of having diverse perspectives and including um, increasing diversity in HPC. So I'll go around and start with Mary, if you want to start with concluding remarks. So I think I want to kind of dovetail with the, the last comments. I think uh, uh, everyone, that, that this is important to the field and everyone should participate in making the field more inclusive and uh, more accessible. And so, uh, uh, just want to uh, encourage everyone to figure out what you can do as an individual. Um, if the whole community is doing it, it will make the most impact. Thank you, Mary. And, and Richard? Well, I think I just said it a moment ago, and that is, you know, think about accessibility early. Don't, don't think of it as an afterthought uh, because, you know, you may have some legal reasons later to put accessibility in. For example, you want to get a government contract and the government has Section 508 and they require software to be accessible. And, oh, I, I didn't do that yet. No, no. Think about it early and then uh, make your products accessible from day one. Okay, thank you. And Marianne? 
Uh, thank you. Um, I think I, my, for my concluding remarks, I just want to actually share a quote from um, a leadership in science and technology reference handbook. Um, and the quote goes like this. Um, it is said that the truth shall set us free, yet we need freedom to discover the truth. Thus, leaders in science and technology must accept responsibility for the results of their work and for the means they use to accomplish it. Fundamental to that responsibility is respect for facts, for creativity, and for colleagues. And really what we've seen is that cultivating respect for colleagues from underrepresented groups has been a bit elusive so far. And so, um, you know, based on the common uh, sources of attrition, and really it takes all of us to try to think about how to respect cultivate that respect for each other. And that requires understanding each other, understanding everyone's backgrounds, accepting different cultures and developing together an ecosystem where uh, we all can uh, uh, develop, uh, lead towards more innovation and discovery. Thank you, excellent remarks. So I wanna take this opportunity. I think this was so exciting. Um, when um, Vivek Sakar um, approached me about the topic, I immediately said it has to be multiple perspectives um, to have this discussion. And so I'm truly honored to have Marianne, Richard, and Mary here engaged in this roundtable discussion on the, on the importance of increasing diversity in HPC is definitely needed for the health of our field, especially as you pointed out, Marianne, HPC is, involves teams. And so we need to have that diversity. And, and uh, Mary, as you pointed out, when we look at the inclusion, the numbers around the underrepresented communities collectively, that's over 70%. So for the health of our field, we need to be more inclusive and increase our diversity. So with that, I wanna say thank you to the SC organizers for the invitation to have this roundtable discussion. And thank you to our participants, to Mary Hall, to also Richard Latner, and to Mary Ann Luke. It's been a wonderful pleasure, so thank you.